In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to a priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, obeying all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah, his division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents into the, to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I will have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent, not able to speak until the day this happens, because you do not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but kept, but remained unable to speak. Well, when his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Amen. Love God. Love, Love your neighbors. neighbors. The title of my message is Great in the Sight of God, key verse, verse 15. So every year, we go back to Bible passages to help us to prepare our hearts and minds to celebrate the good news of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' birth marks a new era of human history. For example, BC, before Christ, was changed into A.D. Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. So this indicates the historical landmark. Jesus' life and work divide the Old Testament era to the New Testament era. But the gospel starts with John the Baptist, who prepared the way for the Lord. The gospel does not start with Jesus, but the gospel starts with John the Baptist. The birth of John the Baptist as the forerunner of the Messiah had been prophesied long ago. At last, the prophecy was about to be fulfilled by the announcement concerning his birth. But there is another story about two senior citizens who prepared the spiritual environment for the birth of John the Baptist. They were Zechariah and Elizabeth. Today we learn about John's parents. Zechariah and Elizabeth and their faithfulness to God. So while preparing this message, I came to realize that God uses old people to carry out his mission. To keep mankind humble, God in his wisdom uses both old people like Zechariah and Elizabeth and young, young people like King da boy David. Therefore, whether we are old and young, all that matters, is that we follow God faithfully by obeying the Bible. This is what Zechariah and Elizabeth did during the very dark times they lived in. But most importantly, we learn here why John is great in the sight of God. Uh, first, John was born in the dark 
and uncertain times of Herod king of Judea. Look at verse 5. In the time of Herod king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Herod the Great was one of the most ruthless rulers in history. He was an Edomian. He was not a Jew. Edomian is a descendant of Esau. So he was very smart politically, and he was able to become a king of Judea, even though he was not a Jew. Under his rule, not even Herod's own sons were certain of tomorrow. Two of them he strangled to death with his own bare hands. So we are told in Matthew's Gospel that when he heard the news of the birth of Jesus, he ordered the immediate execution of all the baby boys two years and younger in Bethlehem. So in the time of Herod, those points a period of tragedy in the history of Israel. However, Luke skims over Herod as if he was nothing and places his focus on the lives of two old people, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Look at verse 6. Both of them are righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. In a time where marriages are unstable and authority of God's words is always called into question or even resented, this verse is very eye-catching. Both not just one of the couple were righteous in the sight of God. So what did this couple do to be righteous in the sight of God? The Bible recognized them as people who observed all of the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Not only did they outwardly keep all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly, they also did it with a humble spirit. Verse 7 says they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So in that time, also according to verse 25, not having children was a disgraceful matter. So they thought that you, are, you have no blessing from God or it's possible you are cursed by God. That's why you cannot have a children. So this means that they, even though they observed all of the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly, they did not go around casting critical and fault-finding eyes on everyone else. At the same time, they did not use their no children problem as an excuse to compromise God's word. Often we try to put limits on when we'll obey or when we'll not obey God's word. When you get everything we want, we obey. When we do not get what we want, we disobey. This was not this couple's way of life. When they were very young, zealous believers, they obeyed God's word. When they were very old, they also observed God's commandments. Even, if, even when they had a severe life problem, they continued to obey. So from them, we learn what it means to be faithful. On the great day of judgment, what do you want to hear from Jesus? Is he not his words? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Is there any doubt that this is what Jesus will say to Zechariah and Elizabeth? Well done, my good and faithful servant. You are faithful in a land full of unfaithfulness. You are faithful to each other. You are faithful to me your whole life even though you could have used your no children problem to be unfaithful. So what I learned from this couple is their faithfulness to God and to each other in good times and in bad times. That kind of faithfulness has a value like a pearl. You know, pearl is formed from sand collecting in a clam over a long period of time. So likewise, the faithfulness that Jesus is looking for comes over a long period of time, in sickness, in health, in good times, and in hard times. Second John is great in the sight of God. 
Zechariah held, held a very important and respected position as a priest. So in the past, as a way of praying to God, they would choose one priest by lot among 24 divisions twice a year. Each division was made up of 1,000 priests. These chosen priests would then go into the temple alone, burn incense, and pray to the Lord while the people gathered outside the temple. Since there were so many priests, many of them died without enjoying this privilege. But Zechariah was chosen by lot to burn incense. So this means that he won the lottery. No, it was not a lottery that he would collect great sums of money. It was, however, the lottery that placed him in a prime location to pray to God and to have that prayer answered. So because of this fact, it is often agreed that many priests who won the lottery to burn incense went into the temple with a sacred prayer topic to pray along with all the other prayers they had to pray for the nation of Israel, such as uh, coming of the Messiah, the forgiveness of sins, and asking God's help and deliverance for the nation of Israel. You know, our secret prayer topics uh, are the re one reason we come to the church. And our spiritual life may become artificial if we do not have a secret prayer topics. So as for Zechariah, it was his secret prayer topic that moved God to send this angel to let Zechariah know that he would answer his prayer and uh, give him a son. So look at verses 13 through 15a. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. And for, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. So John is great in the sight of God. So let's think about John's greatness in three ways. So firstly, John is great before God because God chose him. Verse 14 says that John's birth would bring great joy to his mother and to his father and to all the neighbors. Why? It was because he was born in the providence of God. The angel said to Zechariah, you have to give him the name John. The name John means God is gracious or the gift of God. God chose John as the forerunner of Jesus. So John was great because he was chosen by God to carry out the work of God. Some people act as if they are doing God a favor when they do something for God. But we must know that we did not choose God, but God chose us. So John chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. So John is great because he was chosen as the forerunner of the Messiah. Secondly, John is great before God because he lived a pure life. Look at verse 15b. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. John lived a pure life before God against the corrupt worldly ways of life. You know, to live a pure life, he did not take wine or other fermented drink. In most cases, drinking is the starting point of all the evil doings. When John lived a pure life before God, people said, he's demon-possessed, and he's not corrupt like one of us. So he slept on the crevices of rocks, and he ate locusts and wild honey. When he lived a pure life, God gave a mighty powerful spirit to him. At the time, the world was immoral and corrupt. As we know well, the corruption makes a man utterly powerless to do anything. But when John lived a pure life before God, God gave him the spirit and power in his inner man. Thirdly, John is great before God because he had God's holy mission. John was sent to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. His mission was to preach the message of repentance to all kinds of people. In time, past and present, people are proud 
because of their sins, because of their ego, because they want to do things on their own. So they hate most to hear the word repent. Repent means turn around, acknowledge that you are wrong, and follow God's way. And John was appointed to carry out this mission of preaching the message of repentance. For this, John rebuked the people's corruption and perversion. John rebuked many runaway fathers to repent and come back to their children. John rebuked the disobedient children to repent and live in the wisdom of God. John even rebuked Herod the Tetra, the evil king, to repent of his sin of adultery. So as a result, Herod put him in a prison and beheaded him one year later. So by worldly standards, John looked like a failure. He didn't have a very successful career. John's ministry lasted only one year. He never performed a miracle. And he was in prison for a year and then beheaded very young in his early 30s. So he might, he might look like a rather obscure and unsuccessful man. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. John accomplished exactly what God wanted him to accomplish. Every one of Jesus' 12 disciples came through John the Baptist. John indeed prepared their hearts to accept Jesus Christ. Indeed, John was great in the sight of God. So here we can learn whom God considers great. It is not those who are successful in this world. It is not those who are to obtain fame, honor, and glory and wealth in this world. It is not even those who are successful in ministry, building a mega church. Though the ones God considers great are those who are faithful before God. So I pray that you may be great in the sight of God. And in the day of judgment, Jesus will say to each of you, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Third, Zechariah received a dumb training due to his unbelief. So how did Zechariah respond to the good news the angel brought him? In verse 18, he asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Zechariah was a man of prayer. He had faith in God's sovereign rule in history. But when his prayer was answered, he was too happy to believe it. Momentarily, he fell into human thinking, forgetting that nothing is impossible with God. You know, he studied the, the Bible so diligently, so he should have remembered the story of Abraham and Sarah that God gave Abraham and Sarah a son, Isaac, when Abraham was 100 years old, and Sarah was 90, well past the age of childbearing. Even a man of God makes a mistake. So the angel Gabriel rebuked him. He, he gave his name. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until, until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the appointed time. Though Zechariah received enough training through his childly situation, he needed more training in order to have faith in God's words. For this God gave him dumb training, training not to speak unbelieving words for nine months. So when Zechariah came out, suddenly he became a pantomime artist. He tried to speak with the sign language. I learned that uh, the, this means that I'm in trouble. Have you heard about that? <laughs> so when you cannot, you know, I heard that one, one girl was kidnapped. So he gave this sign language to passing motorists. The motorists saw it and call 911. So that sign language can be useful, but it can be very frustrating because you cannot really 
convey your thought. The people waiting outside did not know what had happened inside the temple. Anyway, God was training Zechariah in preparation for the birth of John. For the next nine months, Zechariah would meditate on God's word and his faithfulness in silence, in silence. So our God is very gracious. He provided us with all the necessary things, but he gave us even greater news. He gave us Jesus Christ for our sins and the hope of the kingdom of God through his resurrection. But some people here and here and hear this message still do not believe. So as we see here, God takes such signs of unbelief very seriously. It is noteworthy that the angel gave Zechariah dumb training to help him overcome his unbelief and not become a source of unbelief. So from this, we, we can learn that we should self-impose, self-impose dumb training on ourselves. If, we, if the words we speak spread unbelief and doubt. So whenever you, you feel like uh, you, you can say, was of unbelief. Say nothing. Say nothing. And just pray silently. So that God may hear and heal your unbelief. You know, Jesus was a master at helping people overcome unbelief. So remember the story of a father of a demon possessed boy. He spoke words of unbelief to Jesus, saying, oh, Lord, please. If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Take pity on us and help us. That's a word of unbelief. Then Jesus rebuked him, saying, If you can, everything is possible for him who believes. Then the boy's father repented immediately and exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. So when we just believe in Jesus, our prayers will be answered. When we just believe in Jesus Christ, we will receive the good news from God in due time. Look at verses 23 and 24. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. God answered this couple's prayer. He was true to his words. Elizabeth's own testimony to this event is very gracious. Look at verse 25. The Lord has done this for me. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away his disgrace among the people. Some become proud when God blesses them. It is difficult to share their joy when they are very proud. But Elizabeth, on the other hand, acknowledged God's favor to take away her disgrace. Her testimony helps us to see the grace of God in our life. So Christmas is coming soon. We'll celebrate Christmas. So let's take time and remember all the favor God has given us through sending his son, Jesus Christ. Let us also, let us also remember what Zechariah and Elizabeth did during the dark times they lived in. They dedicate their lives for being faithful to God both in observing his commands and also faithful in their prayer. So faithful people like these were the kind of people God used to usher in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. So let's imitate their lives of faith. So most importantly, we learn that even though John looked like a failure in this world, he was a great man in the sight of God. So. Let's strive to be great in the sight of God. So at, on the last day, when you stand before Jesus, you will hear Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant.